today I want to talk about thrust. And to get an understanding for thrust, what I want to do is take a look at a cannon. So what I want to do is have this cannon fire a cannonball horizontally from the barrel. So let's put some numbers to this. Uh, let's say we've got a 200 kilogram cannon. Let's say we've got a four kilogram cannonball. And let's say this cannon fires the cannonball forward at 100 meters per second. Now I don't wanna worry about the motion of the cannon quite yet. Uh, let's just look at the motion of this cannonball. Uh, when the cannon is fired, the cannonball has a force on it uh, over some period of time, and that ultimately puts an impulse on the cannonball. It develops some momentum, and you can see here pretty quickly the total momentum of the cannonball is going to be the mass times the velocity, and that's going to give us a total momentum of 400 kilogram meters per second. So to get from here to thrust, what I want to do is, is take a look at a slightly different situation. That is, let's take a look at a cannon if it was to fire two smaller cannonballs consecutively. Okay, so we've got the same exact cannon, still 200 kilograms. Only this time this cannon, I want to fire not one single four kilogram cannonball. I want it to fire two separate two kilogram cannonballs. So you can see in this case, the total impulse given to the cannonball was the, the mass times the velocity of the cannonball. So the total impulse was 400 kilogram meters per second. In this case, we're gonna have an impulse of two times 100, so that's 200 kilogram meters per second of impulse on this cannonball, and another 200 kilogram meters per second of impulse on this cannonball. So our total impulse in this case is going to be 200 plus 200, that is, wait for it, 400 kilogram meters per second of impulse given to the cannonball. And so the, the first takeaway we get out of this is even though we cut up the cannonball into two separate pieces, there's still the same impulse on the cannonballs in total. And we can go a step farther with this, and let's say this cannon was to fire four one kilogram cannonballs out of the end of the cannon. So now we have our 200 kilogram cannon firing four individual one kilogram cannonballs out the end of the cannon. And what we'll see again is the total impulse given to all of the cannonballs is 400 kilogram meters per second. And so to understand where this is going and how this all ties into thrust, what I wanna go through and do is graph the force by the cannon on the cannonballs in each of these three situations. Okay, so first let's take a look at this first situation where we fired a single four kilogram ball. Uh, now, this four kilogram ball is gonna be pushed down the cannon for some amount of time, and, and then it's just gonna coast through the air horizontally or going into projectile motion. So what we would see is the force by the cannon on the cannonball would be a large force for a short amount of time. And looking at this force versus time graph, what we'll see is there's this force, which only lasts for a little while. Uh, but what we should see if we were to put numbers to this is the total area under this curve is 400 kilogram meters per second. Now, why am I suddenly talking about area under the curve? Well, that's because impulse is given by the equation, the infinite sum of f of t dt. That is to say, if we integrate force as a function of time with respect to time, that's gonna give us impulse. Really all that's telling us is the area under a force versus time graph is the total impulse or change in momentum. So we've got an impulse here of 400 kilogram meters per second. Now next let's take a look at this other situation here. We have two different two kilogram balls fired at two different points in time. So what we'd see in this case is there's a force on the first ball for a little bit of time. And then a little while later, we get another pulse of force on the second ball.
Now because these cannonballs are smaller, they're only two kilograms instead of four kilograms, what we see is it's gonna take less force by the cannon to accelerate the ball up to 100 meters per second over the length of the cannon. And so we see less force, but we see two cannonballs were fired. Now, if you look at this in terms of impulse, the area under the curve here is still the same as the area under the curve when we fired a single cannonball. And we see the same thing when we look at the four individual one kilogram cannonballs. So again, what we see is the cannonballs are smaller, so there's less force on them, but because we're firing four cannonballs instead of a single cannonball, we get four little pulses of impulse. And ultimately the total area under the curve is still going to be 400 kilogram meters per second, or the total impulse given to all of the cannonballs is still the same as in our original situation. So the question comes up, where is all this going and how does this tie into thrust? And so what I wanna do is look at one last situation. And that is, what if the cannon was continuously firing cannonballs? All right, so let's take a look at what would happen if we were to take these four kilograms of mass and break it up into a, really an infinite number of teeny tiny cannonballs. And we fired them all continuously out of the cannon at 100 meters per second. It still only has a total mass of four kilograms. We're accelerating all of this mass to 100 meters per second, but rather than dealing with discrete little chunks of mass, we've broken it up into an infinite number of, of masses. The fact of the matter is, what we see every time here, even as we break down the masses further and further, the total impulse is still 400 kilogram meters per second. And so we'll see exactly that right here. The total impulse is still just going to be 400 kilogram meters per second. So what would that look like on our graph? Well, that would look like a steady line. This should be red. And just like in the other situations, we find that the total area under the curve is still 400 kilogram meters per second. But what we have now is a constant force. And so with this constant force, we can change how we look at impulse just a little bit. Uh, if we're looking at impulse as the infinite sum of f of t dt, when we look at impulse now that we have a constant force, we can simply say this is the force multiplied by the time over which that force is applied. Or to get at our end goal, and that is talking about thrust and understanding thrust, let's rearrange this for force. So really force is impulse over time. Now, to get to thrust and how we can calculate the thrust, I want you to realize force is really just thrust, or thrust is really just a force. So we can say that thrust would be equal to impulse, that is mass times velocity over time. So I'm going to rearrange this in kind of a strange way, and you'll see why in a moment. This equation is telling us how much thrust there is as a function of mass, velocity, and time. Now, what we've done in this situation is we've only let a certain amount of mass, that is four kilograms, come out of the end of this cannon. Now, in this case, this cannon, which is constantly spewing out mass at 100 meters per second, we could let this move on and on and on. For, for as long as we wanted, provided we continued to fuel the cannon with more mass to push out the end of the cannon. And we get to this sort of strange term here, and this is M over T. This term right here is a mass per unit time, or what we would call a mass flow rate. See, when we're talking about rockets, the mass flow rate is really just how quickly mass is coming out of the end of the rocket. And this velocity, that's, that's typically given by parameters of the rocket or geometry of the rocket and pressures within the rocket that, that we don't need to get into. We typically say this is a constant value. And so the thrust is really just the mass flow rate multiplied by the velocity. So I'll rewrite this the way we'll typically see this. So this right here, this little M with a dot over it, this is how we show mass flow rate. 
And this equation tells us how we can relate thrust to mass flow rate and velocity. And I want you to realize in all of this, really what we've come up with as a conclusion is that thrust, or really force going back up here, is nothing other than an impulse per time. So in this problem, what we've managed to do is take a look at a single projectile and then broken it up further and further and further until we get to a point where we see a constant flow of mass out the end of this cannon. Effectively, what we've done is we've turned it into a rocket. Now, what I want you to realize is if we put a force on the gas or the cannonballs, which are coming out of the cannon, there's an equal and opposite force on the cannon. So if there's a certain force on this gas, there's going to be an equal and opposite force on the cannon in the opposite direction, which is ultimately going to cause it to be pushed in the opposite direction. All we've done here is we've turned our cannon into a rocket sled. And on that note, that's all for now.